scroll up at the end as well if you ever want to contact me. So I like to start off with a big hi, everybody. Hi, um, Dr. Nick. I was hoping I'd get it. No, I don't think. Um, so just a little description about what the content of my talk is going to be. Uh, obviously talking about Drupal. Um, not going to assume you know anything particular about Apache or MySQL. Those, those sort of things help if you're running a Drupal site. Um, not going to go through all the details of doing a, a, a basic install of Drupal, but we'll kind of cover some of the uh, high level. Uh, we're going to talk about how to install modules, how to install things, uh, but we're not going to get into uh, any details about doing your own custom module development or theme development. That's really a high level topic. Uh, I'm also going to be focusing on Drupal 7. I think most of these things would be applicable for Drupal 6, although for a new install I would definitely go with Drupal 7 at this point. Uh, and Drupal 8 is out, I don't know when that's supposed to be out, but we won't be covering any of those new features. Uh, there's a talk later today at 11, given by my pal Jerry Smith. I do Drupal 8 if you want to see what's in there. I plan to attend because I don't know what's in Drupal 8. So here's me. This is right about the time I registered at zmonkey.org. Um, I tried to take the most flattering picture of myself uh, sitting at my computer, uh, which is just off camera. Uh, the one that was in my house running zmonkey.org for the longest time, uh, quite a few years actually. Uh, so this is about 2003, uh, and that was when I started with Drupal. I put my blog up on there, fairly basic. Um, since then I've run a number of other sites on Drupal off and on. Uh, they didn't really get too deep into all the possibilities you could do with Drupal um, until just the last couple of years. Started looking at all the, uh, the modules that are available. Uh, but it also didn't really grow up. Like, uh, we'll go into that. So, um, so the need that I had, so I'm going to talk about basically a case study of, of, of a site that I built using Drupal. So, this is another picture of me, slightly more flattering. Um, so, I am a, a member of the volunteer search and rescue team. And this is me out on a training event in the snow. We actually dug some uh, pits in the snow, buried ourselves, or they buried me, um, and then I waited for the dogs to come find me. Uh, and they did. I got out. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of fun, and, and the dogs are great because some of them are, and they have such personality, but uh, some of them are very excited to find you and very excited to just trample all over you. <laughs> so I wouldn't say it's the the best thing, but you know, the alternative of being stuck in a hole, no, it was good. So, as a search and rescue, we do a lot of training, we go out on our rescue missions, we have a bunch of like factual information we keep track of. You know, it's very important to make sure that everybody's uh, CPR certifications are up to date. People who are on the rope team have done their rope training, those sort of things. So, data is, is uh, important uh, for us. Uh, and until last year, we were using a third-party service to keep track of this. And for various uh, reasons, much too detailed to get into here, we needed to move off of that third-party service. And I thought, you know, I could throw up something in Drupal. Like, it, it could do all of this stuff. So I built a proof of concept, tested it out, looked great, uh, built the site, and we've been running on it. Uh, for I guess the better part of a year now. Um, it's been working really well. So why did we choose Drupal? Well, not really for a technical reason. It's not because we said, well, Drupal's gonna do a better job at this than you know, X technology. Um, but Drupal had a bunch of things. Uh, I mean, to be honest, one of them was that I knew it, and there were a lot of other technology people in the group, and I was doing it, so I picked what I knew. Um, but it, you know, I certainly wouldn't have chosen it if it hadn't met our needs. It's it's flexible in that we could bend it to our will. You know, we could we were able to customize it to do just just what we wanted and nothing more and nothing less. And we needed something that was going to be simple for end users to manage. Uh, I couldn't have something that you needed a code monkey to get in there and edit PHP. That's just way beyond the level of, of my users. 
we needed something that we could adapt to mobile and that could um, hide a lot of the details and just present the, the necessary information. And Drupal's kind of lived up to it. But Drupal didn't always start, wasn't always that way. It was a much simpler tool when it started. And I show this because I think it's an inter interesting to see where it came from and why, why things are, are the, the current way they are. So this is an example. I, I downloaded uh, Drupal version 4, which is what I started my blog with uh, oh so many years ago. Um, and this was kind of it for what you could do with Drupal. It was, think, think of Slashdot 15 years ago. I don't know if you guys were in the Slashdot back then. Um, you could do a site more or less like that. Um, and you could have, you could create content that had a title and a body. And in these settings here, there's something about whether this should be interpreted as PHP or HTML. So if you want to do anything fancy, you need to just throw in some PHP code. That seems like a great idea. Um, whether commenting is allowed, whether uh, it should create a menu entry, who the author is, and whether it's published and promoted to the front page. And that was kind of it. And, and for running a blog, certainly it was sufficient. Um, just to show you, the, the, this is the, when you're editing the stories so in that previous slide here, uh, this is what they call a story. Um, there was also a static page which didn't have like comments, and, uh, and you could go in and edit this story type. Really, all you could do is just give an explanation of what the the, the story was, a minimum number of words, and whether she published and whether she go into moderation. That was kind of it. Not a lot of flexibility there. So, since then and until now, they've added a, a bunch of new things with Drupal that make it really great. Uh, custom field types. So in the example we had some text fields, we had some, some options, um, and that was kind of it. Uh, you couldn't create your own field type. So they've added the ability to create modules that can, you can use to define these field types. So a date, you know, you can have a little date picker, and an email address. So you can do an email address as a string, obviously, you can store a date as a string, but a date type, an email type, will do validation on that and make sure that the email address is parsable, uh, make sure that the date matches a certain format. Uh, you know, if, if you want long dates, if you want European dates, um, if you want a timestamp, those sorts of things. So all sorts of fields are available to throw in there. You can create your own custom content type. So that story we had, Instead of just having a title and a body, you can throw in your own fields. Uh, you know, the email address of the person who posted it, uh, a little image to post along with it. Instead of having to put the image into the HTML itself, you can attach the image directly and have the formatting be done automatically. And then uh, they added, well, they, they had taxonomies, but they increased the power of them. Um, so a taxonomy, uh, it's kind of, it took me a while to wrap my head around it, but it's basically just a list of things. Uh, so they have, uh, you have a vocabulary, which is a list of terms. So, for example, if we wanted to, we were going to create a website that was keeping track of our, our book collection, our library. Um, we might define a vocabulary that was like the genre. So we could have our terms would be science fiction and uh, romance. And those sorts of things. And then we can create another taxonomy that's like the cover type. You can have hardback, softback, leather bound, uh, those sorts of things. Um, so between all those things, you actually have a lot of um, powers. So this is a screenshot of, um, of my search and rescue site. And you can see, so this, this is a headline. So this is just an object that's in there. And you can see that it's quite a bit different than that other Drupal site. You know, I've, I've, I've customized the menu over here, I've added my own entries. Um, you know, the, the name shows up at the top. I've got all these different fields. Um, the user is actually pulling from another field. You can define the user. Um, these are a date field. This is a taxonomy field. Um, and then the layout can be customized. I'll show you the, the editing part of it. 
you can make these things required, right? Like you can't move on right. unless you. So if you wanted to require it, okay, yeah. Yeah. So if you want, you want to require one, you can definitely mark that, and you see that the asterisk there says that the category is required. It doesn't have to be assigned to it. So this is in our inventory part of our application the equipment section. So I suppose names should really be required. You know, location. If it's not assigned to anybody, may not have. I suppose it should have a location. Um, like box anyway. four in the storage unit. Yeah. So this one is is assigned out to a particular user. Um, so the location would be you know wherever he is. Uh, some things don't have a serial number. Um, that sort of thing. You know the, the in service date. If it hasn't been placed in service, that wouldn't be fine. But the status you definitely need in the category. There are ways you can make these codependent. So if this field is set to in service, then the in service date has to be set. Um, uh, yeah, I can't remember which module that's in. Um, it's a lot. Um, so we talked a lot about these custom modules. Have you, has anybody installed a custom module before? I guess I should have asked. Have you used Drupal at all or new to it? I've used it. Uh, I went through some of the training through Linda on it and set up a basic Drupal site to play with it. Okay. Ever installed a custom module for it or just use the, the built in? I haven't gotten as far as custom modules. I maintain one that someone else set up that has some custom modules in it, but okay. that was a few years ago. Um, I've never used it. Never used it. Okay. So, custom modules, there's, there's two ways we can install them. Um, they come as a, a tarball or a zip file. And they're all available. Let me show you here. Um, on the Drupal site. I mean, obviously, so you can distribute them from wherever you want, but um, people are able to upload them to Drupal. Um, and if we come over here, you can see. Uh, you go, uh, let's click here and we'll look at all the modules. And there are 16,967 modules available for install. It'd be interesting to know how many of those were like uploaded once and never downloaded. I imagine a fair number of them. Um, there's probably a few hundred that are like really like especially useful and I'll go through and show about 10 of them that are particularly um, useful for Drupal. Uh, but this is where you grab So if we wanted to get the views module we, we can come here and see what it's about, see the documentation, where the source code is, and then here's the, the download file. So you can grab this tarball or the zip file, and you can download it and install it manually. You can also just copy the URL, uh, and you can go to your file uh, here and install new module. You can either upload the file or you can just paste the URL in here. Uh, and it'll go and download it for you. That's typically what I do when I'm installing it in, in the browser. Is it available to your course FTP access? Um, I was about to ask if it required FTP access. But. Yeah, you know, it says that, but I don't actually have an FTP server running. So huh. I think what it actually requires is that you know, it, it can either use an FTP server or if the web server has permissions to write to the Drupal install folder. It'll just do it put it locally. Okay, because that I mean that's I do WordPress stuff and it requires and like my my host has FTP off by default. And I yeah. have to go like remember to go out, turn on FTP, then go back. Yeah, I've done a little bit of WordPress and I, I know what you mean. And I think it can do that same sort of thing where it uploads with the FTP, uh, but if it can write directly to it. Then okay. I typically run these on my own virtual machine or you know BPS that sort of thing. Um, so it, that's not an issue for me, but in a shared host, it might be. Um, so the other way, and I would rec I would suggest that the better way, if you have the, the capability of it, is a tool called Drush. So what is Drush? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, Drush is a command line for Drupal. And I would have to say, it's as awesome as it sounds, like a command line or something. Um, it's a way to do a lot of the things that you might do with Drupal through the web interface through, this, through a command line. So this opens up all sorts of possibilities with cron jobs, scripts, um, 
that sort of thing. Uh, I tell you, doing a Drupal upgrade using uh, Drush is just a thousand times easier than doing it uh, with the web files. Um, some distros have packages of Drush that you can just have to install. It, um, Drush is actually a separate project in that it has a separate code base and a separate release schedule from Drupal. So uh, the current version of Drush supports older versions of Drupal. You don't have to get one that specifically matches your version of Drupal. Uh, if you want to use Dr Drupal 8 or like the release candidates for it, you do need the latest and greatest Drush. Uh, but they're pretty much all backwards compatible. Um, so if you don't need to have the packages, here's the method for installing it manually. Um, you use a tool called Composer, which I'm not entirely sure. I didn't get too deep into it. I only got as far as I needed to get Composer installed so I could brush install. But it's kind of... Composer's a package manager. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more or less a CPAN-esque thing for PHP. Okay, so CPAN is bad. So, so you install it following the instructions in Git Composer, and then you run this command composer global require drush slash drush colon 6 dot star, where 6 dot star manager. is the, the uh, oh, sorry, so yeah, CPAN is the package manager of the world. Uh, 6 dot star is the version here, so um, there's instructions on the, on the drush page about how to do that. And once you install that, it puts it into your local. Uh, in this Composer vendor bin location. Um, and so you have to add that to your path. And then you can run commands like drush dl. So in this example, ctools is a module. We'll cover about what ctools is and does. Uh, but if we want to download that module, we say drush dl ctools. So that will download it and put it into our uh, Drupal install. It won't be enabled, just like when you install it from the web, it installs it but doesn't turn it on. So if we want to enable it, we have to say EN for enable. Uh, this one I ran into as I was testing Drush CC all. This is clear cache. So uh, Drupal keeps a cache of pages so it doesn't have to render them fully each time. If you want to clear the cache, you can do that. So just as an example of something you can do. Uh, Drush PML. So some of these commands are a little bit cryptic about what the command is. Uh, if you just run Drush without any arguments, it will show you a full uh, help screen of uh, all the different things you can do. Uh, PML stands for Project Manager List. So project Manager meaning modules. So list all the modules that are installed. That includes all the core modules, all the custom modules that are in there. Anything that's registered with Drupal. So I'll show you an example of that. So here are all the modules that are installed uh, in this version. So here, uh, can you see that? Has all the, the schema changes or version 
so you can look at what the current version is of all the various schema elements and know which ones need to be updated. So it's pretty clean. I, I had really haven't had trouble with Drupal upgrades in the past. So the Drush update does both then? It does both. Okay, because I know I have done one of those and it was like you had to go download it, untar it, and then go to the website to yeah, so if you're going to do it manually, that's how you do it. With Drush will do both in one. Um, and uh, super, super handy. I, I really like it. So these are the modules. As I was going through looking at which ones I would recommend that you get to know as you're trying to build your, your site with Drupal, uh, these are the ones that, that I came up with. Um, so uh, C Tools is the Chaos Tools. Um, it's really not one, so I, I kind of split these in two. So the ones on the left-hand side here are things that enable a lot of extra functionality for developers. So modules on the right-hand side here use these modules underneath. You probably won't interact directly with these ones a lot, but this Chaos Tools allows a bunch of additional features, um, such as the, the panels, uh, which allows you to override default pages in, in Drupal so you can create your own layouts. Uh, Entities lets you treat a content type, they call it a, a node, lets you treat it as an object and manipulate it. The token lets you take the values out of those content types and reference them by name so that you can do substitution. So one field can reference another field. Entity token is a way for your entities to become tokenized. The entity reference is a way for your content types to reference each other. So for example, um, going back to here. So um, this is a, a content type of equipment. We created a node as an equipment type. And we said we want the, the user to be assigned to be a user out of a list. So I created this other user, and now I can link to them Link that person from the equipment. And you can have bi-directional links, things like that. Um, so that's what the entity reference. And also is the way that we reference the taxonomy. Uh, really gives you that additional power. So that's those ones that are kind of back end stuff. On the front end, uh, these are the ones that I really like. So uh, panels is an additional tool for, for doing your, your layout. Uh, path auto is um, when default Drupal will update your path based on all the different parameters that you're looking at. If you want, if you want to have, so you can override that name and say this page has this name and it's this you know pretty one that you know user slash um, cork right. So you can have a page that has that name. Um, but if you want those names to be generated automatically based on the content of that page, then you need the path auto. So it uses these tokens to read out of the entities to put into the path and automatically update. So you can see how these modules link to each other. Um, views is a way to write your own queries and come up with um, your own lists of things. By default, um, Drupal will display things kind of in a just a running fashion where you, know, you post because um, it goes back to that that history of it being a uh, kind of a like a news website where you, you post a story and then you post another story and they, they, they as you keep moving them up they move down and then they move off the page to the next page so that's the default way that Drupal will display things so if you want to create your own queries to display in your own way you can just use uh, meta tags is, if you're familiar with the Facebook open graph or Twitter cards, uh, if you want to manipulate the meta tags of a page so that you can add extra meta info. So for example, if you want your page to show up when people uh, post it to Facebook and have a nice little uh, icon with it and a little blurb and that sort of thing, that can be hidden to meta tags. Uh, not hidden necessarily, but it's not visible to the end user directly unless they go you know, poking around. So some additional modules that I like and I typically use, uh, which depending on your usage you may like as well, field group is a way to group your fields into sections. Uh, this 
to me handy if things are somewhat related and you want to put them like logically next to each other. A field collection is where you want to define a certain field that has multiple subcomponents. Um, and I'll have to get in and show you how, how that's done. Um, Admin menu, um, we actually saw that in action here. Um, that's this thing up, up at the top here. Really just, it's, it only shows up for people who are administrators and um, really just a convenience for, for you as an admin, but really handy to be able to come in here and browse um, through the menus and jump right to where you want rather than going, you know, click on configuration, click on content types, click on this content type. It saves you quite a few steps, so I, I really like that one. Uh, and then the module filter, uh, I'll show you that real quick. Go to the modules. Uh, this is the module filter here, so we can look at things that are just related to date time. We can search for a particular module, uh, search for just modules that are enabled. Uh, that one's just handy. Uh, again, if you're, if you're using Drush, you may not really come into this modules page a whole lot, uh, but if you ever need to, then that makes it really useful. Cool. Alright, so then when we're getting ready to preview it up, because the default themes, they're okay, um, but we want to be able to create our own. Um, we can use those. <coughs> the nice thing is themes are really just modules that instead of tying into the data hooks on the back side, they're tying into the presentation hooks on the front side. So we install them the same way. We grab them from the same locations. Uh, you can browse through them on the, on the website. You can hop over here and get it. So instead of looking at the modules, we look at the themes. Uh, and they're just listed here the same way. So. Uh, Zen is a very popular one. Uh, Zen is that actually a, uh, an extendable theme. So some themes are meant to be used as is. Uh, some themes are meant to be uh, extended or you can create uh, sub-themes uh, without modifying the original files, which is kind of handy. It, it, it really gets to be fairly complicated you know, if you want to get just exactly right. Uh, so same way you can grab the tarball or just install it by its name. Which is what I've got here. So we would download it and enable it. Now if you want it to set to set it to the default, I don't know if there's a direct command for that, you go into the themes. You can actually have multiple themes enabled for Drupal. You can allow users to change their themes so if they want to see it in a particular way. Um, Again, kind of going back to slash dogs, remember they used to have like different color schemes. So you could have the green one, or the white one, or the pink one. And uh, so they have that capability. I don't know, I don't typically use it. I like to focus on one theme at a time um, and not have to make sure my site looks good in a lot of themes, but uh, that's up to you. There are some ways you can use multiple themes with mobile responses. So if you want to have one theme for mobile views versus one theme for desktop views, you can do that. Or, a lot of the modules, or a lot of the themes themselves, are mobile responsive, so they automatically reflow. Um, and that's what I've got going here. So if we were to take this page and shrink it, so you can see how this default view, um, it has these side by side, but if we make the page smaller, as if we were on a mobile, now it puts the menu up at the top and moves the list down below it. Uh, so this theme I'm using, and I can't remember which theme it is from the top of my head. Um, is it love? I don't think so. No. Uh, parents. Oh, you know what I did? I created a Actually, using a sub theme of yeah. Sorry. 
Really yeah, no, I'm getting lost. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's actually a sub theme that I enabled via Drush, and I don't know why I'm not seeing it here. So, um, it's time for a live demo. Everybody loves live demos, right? Except the presenter. Um, so, I'm going to go ahead and log out of my page and show you the default page here. So, uh, Drupal has a lot of flexibility in permissions and uh, user. No granting access to things. So here what I've done is I've set the default page to be one that requires a login. So when you try to go to the default page, it pops up the login page for you. Now I've got my password saved just for convenience. We'll go ahead and log in and then it'll take us to that default page. So this is actually a, a copy of my real database where you can see I've scrubbed the, the, the personal information out. Uh, that's not really their email addresses, if that's what you were thinking. Uh, so, uh, this is a view. So, I wanted to have a list. Of, so, each of these things here is, uh, is a, a user. I got created a content type called member, and I went in and defined all these fields. And then I wanted just a printable list that people could uh, see everybody, and then uh, it actually does print out. How did I do that? There's a way to print it out. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so this is a view. And we'll go in and look at the details of that. Um, and let's move this to pictures and notes. Um, so let's go look at this member content type. So if we go in here, here's this user and I'm using user 820. Um, you can see that I've customized um, all these fields and I've actually created this tabbed interface just to keep it from scrolling too far. Um, and each of these is a, it's called a mini panel. Um, so we come in here and these are the various qualifications. So this user, um, we don't have on record when it's CPR so we do have the gun safety, so you know, get that out of the way. Uh, but uh, a lot of the other things. So sometimes some of our data uh, a little fuzzy. Um, and then let's go ahead and look at how this is set up. So we're going to go ahead and look at the member content type. So custom content types is really the, the driving force between the kind of data driven and Drupal website. Um, so we've got our, our basic information here. You can see this is my path auto. Uh, no, this is not auto title, uh, where it generates the title. Otherwise, you have a separate title from the field from the fields. And it seemed weird to me to have a person with a title and not a name. So I hid the title field, told it to hide the hide the title, and fill in the title with the information from the full name field, and I did that with this. So this is an example of the, uh, a token. So this is a token that's going to get the info in the title will be replaced by the info that's read through that token out of the node, uh, the node module, and it's going to look up the field with the name of name. So we'll look at that here. So these fields, so by default, if, if we were to create a new content type, it would have a title and a body and then uh, some other things about like the, the date that it was published. So these are those things from that original version of Drupal um, that it, it has based on the idea of it being a, you know, a new site. But here, I've defined all these other content types. A full name, a status, an ID number, an email, on and on and on. Um, all these fields with dates about when they completed various things. Um, so let's see what a, let's 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 add a new field um, to this, and I think we should call this field. Um, we want to keep track of the awesomeness of the person, right? How awesome they are. So we have a few different options. So these are the the uh, field types that we've got enabled. So we could have a field type of a scale from one to a hundred, how awesome they are. Hundred being the max, I guess. 
uh, we can have just a list where you can write out how awesome they are. This guy is super awesome. This guy is kind of a tool, right? Um, or we can do something a little more interesting. We'll, we'll do an entity reference. And actually, it'll be a term reference. Term reference is where you reference a taxonomy. Um, entity reference is where you reference other content types. So in order to do that, we actually have to create the taxonomy first. Uh, it's kind of the, the bottom up. You know, the thing that's referenced has to be has to exist first. So we'll go in here and add a vocabulary. We'll call this awesomeness. How awesome. So now we've got this thing. So we're going to add terms to it. So the first term, so the name is going to be the name that would show up in your drop down list. Description is just a, a, a a thing for the administrator to know what, what this one means. Uh, and so in some contexts, the description is a little bit redundant. So in this case, we'll say, uh, start out with not awesome. So we created, we created a new term that's named not awesome. We'll say slightly awesome. Checkboxes or an autocomplete uh, tagging sort of thing. So terms can be used for tagging. You can actually set them up so that they can, so when somebody's creating a new content type, they can automatically create new tags. That's really handy. So we'll do a select list. And then we come down and we say save. So now that field has been added. It's going to ask, ask us which one we want to reference. Awesomeness and any help text we want to display on the page. And if there's a default value, we'll say default is probably uh, you know, slightly awesome. So you'll see these are ordered uh, by alphabetical. There's ways you can, you, you can use views to change that ordering. Uh, and the number of values. So a field can have uh, more than one value. Uh, in this case, we'll just have a default. Um, and then, so when we added that field, now it's down here at the bottom. The, all of the um, all the existing people will have a null for that. So let's hop over real quick and just look at our view. Maybe we want to, we want to create a view where we can see a list of the awesomeness. We're going to add a new view, and we're going to say number awesomeness. And it's going to be an HTML list of you know, show. Here we go. So show is 
can be a type, we're going to show content of type member, and we want uh, a table, a table of fields. So we're going to create that. And I know I'm messing through this real quick. Oh, I think I already created the view while I was testing. So let's go ahead and just look at what we did. So when you when you do that, it'll dump you into this same thing. So uh, it has a, a a name. So this is the title that we gave it. This is the type table. You can go in and modify that a little. But you can change to any of the different formatters you want. You can select which fields you want to display. If I want to um, show different fields off of the member, so here's their awesomeness. I want to display their awesomeness. Uh, and then filter criteria. So maybe I only want people who have an awesomeness of a certain level, that sort of thing. Any, any field on that type can be used. And then the sort criteria. And down here at the bottom, you'll see that it's showing us their awesomeness, but it's, it's empty. So this is your, your preview. Um, and then up here is where you set your path. So this is what it will be, it'll show up as um, in the URL. You can create a, a menu entry along the left here. So these ones, um, I guess I can point at the mouse and I'll walk across the screen. Um, permissions, if you want to, you can create your own custom permissions. You can reuse the ones that are in there, but you can sign a permission to this view. So only users can have this permission. Throw a header and a footer. There's some really advanced stuff that we don't have time to get into. But if you want to link to other content types, so if the person links to a Place, for example, and you want to pull in the information about that place and display it, you have to uh, create uh, a relationship to that other one and, and tell it. This is like in a SQL query where you're doing a join, you have to tell it which one it's joined to, otherwise it defaults to bring it in. Um, there are different types of views. So views is really powerful. Um, you can create feeds, um, create uh, blocks that you can set as a little, as like a little embedded piece that goes into Drupal, um, more pages. So you can have a, a one view you can create copies of, so it has slightly different um, pages. Um, the feed thing is actually kind of cool. So I did one where I have a, an event calendar. So you create an event and you say where it's going to be, what the date is, you know, those sorts of things. And then um, the format can actually be an iCal feed. So now I can feed that directly into my phone and get that list on my calendar. So I know we're running short on time here, so um, there's certainly a lot of capabilities there. Like just um, browsing around at, at the site, um, here, you know, looking at the equipment list and um, these things. Um, there's, you know, there's a reporting, there's just an immense amount of capabilities there. So if the site really is about the data and not about really for use cases like that, it can be extended to all sorts of things. Um, but I really like the way that everything I've done here, I've done without getting in and writing a single line of PHP. I was able to do it all through the admin interface and you know, one click, which for me was just a, a much lower barrier to entry, and it's been working really well for us. So what Drupal does actually is it turns all into PHP. Uh, yeah, so Drupal itself is all in PHP, uh, and it um, the, the way the modules each handle it, some of them have more PHP, some of them push more uh, into the, the database. They, they extend the schema on their own and create their own tables. Um, so it, it kind of depends on the, the module. Um, any other questions? If you guys, if you guys have questions, you can always shoot me a, a message and try to answer. Uh, I would throw in a plug for there's there's a lot of great YouTube videos out there to show you how to do stuff with Drupal. Uh, one that I found really useful is called uh, Daily Dose of Drupal. Um, it's probably oh, there's hundreds of them literally, and he goes into a lot of the details on all these things about here's how you create this kind of view. If you want to create a view with this kind of thing, here's how we do it. He walks through. Um, it's pretty polished, so I would recommend that one. There's a lot of other ones out there as well. 
Want to talk about seven versus eight? Uh, I do not. Okay. Uh, if you uh, check in at eleven o'clock, there's going to be another presentation about Drupal eight. Right. I, I actually part of your take. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, I really haven't looked too far. I've been focused on Drupal seven, um, and so I haven't looked at, at Drupal eight uh, really at all. I don't know that much. So, so I'm going to be attending Drupal, Drupal two. Pardon? Do you use it? Yes. Uh, there are actually, I was going to talk about, there are actually a lot of uh, big websites that are using Drupal. I was looking around at one of the prom prominent ones, whitehouse.gov. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you hit the prediction. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a, a bunch of other ones. Obviously, the Drupal site is running Drupal as well. And like all those things where it's listing all those modules out and everything, it's all done underneath the Drupal. So quite powerful. Obviously, it's a very high traffic site. 